By the year 2020, we had flooding events 147 days of the year. So almost half of the days of the year, we had flooding events that impacted the battleship. If people can't get to our ship and can't park once they get here, or are afraid to drive through the water, rightly so, afraid to walk through the water, again, rightly so, then our business model is threatened and we needed to find a way to solve access issues. We are in Wilmington, North Carolina, and behind me is the USS North Carolina. Battleship North Carolina is birthed on Eagles Island, immediately adjacent from downtown Wilmington. Commissioned in 1941, it was the first of America's fast battleships, designed and built for the coming World War II. Battleship North Carolina was the first major ship to enter Pearl Harbor after the bombing. It did see action in every major event in the Pacific theater from six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor to the signing of the treaty with Japan. The Navy in the late 50s started to begin to decommission and, and sort of move ships off its rolls. And that's when the Navy contacted representatives in North Carolina and said, this is your opportunity. There were a group of North Carolinians who were very, very interested in bringing the USS North Carolina home to its name state. And they launched a statewide campaign one of the groups that they reached out to were school groups, uh, and part of the campaign was if school children donated their pennies and nickels and dimes, and every child in your school donated, then all the children in the school received a free ticket to the battleship North Carolina, and that created kind of the first wave of visitors to the battleship North Carolina. It also created a passion for the ship and a love of the ship. We're at an interesting place where a lot is happening in terms of hydrology. Something that's really unique about this area is where we currently are standing. We get both discharge from the lower Cape Fear River and we're low enough in the estuary that we get semi-diurnal tidal influence. So we have too high and too low tides a day that influence this location. So we have this confluence of river flow and tidal flow happening right here. In coastal areas like this, we have honestly a multitude of potential impacts from climate change. One of the most obvious being increased flooding from things like sea level rise or changing frequency of storm impacts. We're on the river, so we see the river every day. And the conditions of your environment then become something that you almost unconsciously track. And around 2015, leadership noticed that there was a change in the river. And what was occurring, what was changing was an increased frequency in tidal flooding. I have an academic background and so I decided to do a trend analysis to find out how much the flooding may be changing over time. Under the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge, they've been monitoring water level and therefore tides for over a hundred years. It's one of the longest running tide gauges in the state of North Carolina and in fact in the southeast. NOAA realized that the conditions here at the site exactly mimic the tidal conditions at the tidal station at the foot of the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge. So the tidal record at the bridge was a database that I could use to determine if the tide's impact was getting worse and if so by how much. I did a historic trend analysis. The results showed an over 7,000% increase in tidal flooding since the battleship arrived in Wilmington in 1961. Yeah, We went from double digit uh, tidal flooding in the 40s, 50s, and 60s to then triple digit. In terms of operations, our road was being flooded, um, sometimes very severely, and sheet flooding across the water was moving across the road. It wasn't stable, it wasn't standing still. Our parking lot then would often be flooded. Because we're required by law to operate under revenues generated through ticket sales and gift shop sales, if visitors can't get to our site or are not comfortable parking once they get here and they turn around and leave, then our business model is threatened and ultimately we will not be able to be sustainable financially. 
So there was a real economic impact to our operations and the survival of the ship. The leadership really decided to go an innovative way with living with water, rather than doing kind of standard bulkhead and wall building to try to keep the water out, we decided to do nature-based infrastructure. Living with water really has four components. One is, is the installation of a living shoreline in areas where the shoreline had been hardened. The second is the installation or recreation of a wetland area that has not been there for many, many decades. The third piece of it is the elevation of the remaining parking lot area. And the fourth piece is education. This project is honestly one of a kind in the state. The fact that this is several hectares, several acres of, of property that they are proactively creating this resilience and flood mitigation project on is almost unheard of. I am one of three different research labs at the university. We are monitoring a series of stations for multiple things across the whole site, mostly to examine what the baseline conditions were, so what, what everything started at. We've been able to continue the monitoring through the construction process. That is actually a piece of the science that is a big unknown. And then several years after, to look at the potential long-term impacts. It provides this incredible local opportunity for students to be able to come out here, be involved in a applied community project, and also collect data and learn skills that they can apply to you know, a future professional career. We're not unique in these impacts and in our circumstances. There are many communities along the coast who are similarly being impacted by rising seas and tidal flooding. And we realized that we had an opportunity to install some unique aspects to manage our tidal flooding and to document how well they are working. We take that role seriously in terms of being able to provide a model to other communities. This is one of the first and largest projects to incorporate all of these different components in one site and that kind of holistic approach is what we need going forward. That's the only way to tackle these kind of big picture problems is from a holistic view.